So, my name is Friedrich Wetschnik. I'm the CEO from Flex. Flex is an uh, electronic manufacturing service. We are a 26 billion company. Uh, most of, um, most likely, something you have at home is manufactured by us or some piece of it. Uh, I'm the CISO. I also run networking, cloud governance, and a couple of other things. Um, and I'm a traditional enterprise, so, which is interesting because I heard a lot about cloud today, right, which is more focused on consumer, which is definitely far ahead of the journey than we are. But uh, I will give a quick talk where I think you well, I think we need to rethink security a little bit when we're in the cloud age. And I give some examples, and I would be on time so that you can go for the cocktails. You can ask questions about it. Um, so what is why security? So I'm the security field for 15 years, and it was a development over the years. What I love on security really is, uh, is how much is changing over time. So any new infrastructure comes in, any new things you see, you have to rethink security, right? And Someone asked me one time if I'm crazy to have this job, and our, the former speaker actually from Nova is right, actually. No, I don't. I love the job because it's a challenge, actually, and this is very interesting to mine. And I started in security like when I was in engineering school. I have a degree in, in electrical engineering. We reprogrammed our whole college lighting system because we figured out the root password to that and my friends and myself like they thought it's funny to do some dis like disco lightning in the school. The principal did not like it. My mom also not when she had to show up at the principal's office for that. But cybersecurity is a real risk these days, right? As we often all talk about data breaches. The funny thing is I think about data breaches is I think we are so used to it we don't really care anymore. Who cared about Capital One? Who cared about Equif Equifax? I think my accounts are preached. I'm five years in US, I think three or four times in, my in the last five years, well, maybe my credential has been leaked. And we don't really care anymore, right? Because we hear it so often, and we don't think it has, it has no impact. If you think about WannaCry and all this kind of stuff, it does have an impact. There was a financial insert to that. Company lost hundreds of million, which m most likely was resulting in layoffs which most likely is citing in things that happen to families, right? So it has an impact. If you think about why well, I think it was a kind of a wake up for me, is actually uh, Maersk, for example, not bad year, which was a nation state attack, 300 million one company at the loss, $300 million. That's a significant loss for a company, actually. Um, if you ever bring your son, or if you ever ha end up with your with your family in an emergency room, which happens quite often to me because my son plays ice hockey. As you see, all the connected devices, which actually has to resort in like, has to running to do all the checks, right? Then you understand how critical infrastructure is these days now, because think about that, you can't do going surgery without having all these kind of things now, without having this connected transferring digital images or whatever it is. So, this is a significant issue we, we are talking about. Who are you dealing with? Who we are dealing with? The nation state political things like anonymous insiders and criminals. If you are smart, I think you go on the dark side, which is the criminals, because it's unbelievable how much money it is and how easy it is. Like ransomware, 1 billion. Business email compromise, we are talking about 21 billion right now loss of company, what company lost, and people transferred money about it. It's a really big industry. And by the way, they run, it's not like, imagine this like a hacker sitting in a room and is doing stuff on his laptop. It's actually really like, like enterprise organizations now. They have training departments, they have actually user service, by the way. Ransomware has great use, YouTube videos where how you use Bitcoins and how to train you on that one, right? And also like insiders is a big thing, as we know from Capital One. And political numerous is not so right, but I'm seeing this coming up again in nation state. It's a wide, wide west. Everyone is doing whatever he wants to do, which is a kind of an issue for me in an enterprise because I am multi-geographical. So you're in the middle of anything, right? Anyone is attacking everything. There's no protocols. And that has to be definitely at some point being addressed. What is the real motivation is still financial gain. So they want to make money. And that's the biggest thing. Even if you espionage, it's all about data theft. It's about money, right? Grunge and those kind of things, you see a lot of less. And that's from the Horizon Data Preacher Board. But the majority of things, it's still coming down to money. 
debt drives financial criminals and all this kind of stuff, right? Even if you look at the, some other uh, nation states, it's actually how to they advance their business, their economic, right? And then I don't mention any countries here, but it's really like it's very specific what the what their China wants to be. So it's a very industry, very interesting industry, because if you look like at the target hack, there's someone who provides the crime as a service, who writes the mirror, who distributes the mirror. There's someone who is doing the money laundering, someone doing the washing. There is a really a whole industry about it. So the cloud is no different from the on-premise. Nothing is really different at this perspective. Where it comes, where it's different is how you think about the cloud. So I'm coming from Europe, and Europe is the most majority, if you like to speak in Germany or in Austria or wherever it is, I'm from Austria, is public cloud is not secure. I can't transfer my data into the cloud. Or if you read about it is, what you hear a lot of is like cloud made in Germany or something like, or cloud made in Europe, right? That's a big thing right now to do that. The data localization of the data center has nothing to do with security. This is a wrongly concept in my opinion. Because I store my data in Germany, it has absolutely nothing to do with security. It's a concept of politics where you think um, they get access to the data or you have like this kind of sense, oh yeah, it's stored in my country. Uh, it might be safe because I, don't, I trust my government more or less, but it, it has not really something to do with security. Same thing if I hear, and I heard this a couple of times, public clouds secures everything. So if you're in Google, you are secure. If you're in AWS, you're secure. If you're in, we already know that's not true. But I still hear this from companies which are not mature, that these are the concepts we are talking about. Uh, everything is exposed to the internet. Everything is like never touch a running system. So I could never touch a running system is an on-premise thing, uh, which uh, I think I translated that once we are set up in the cloud, we are done. We never do config management or those kind of things. So I had an interesting talk this morning about Capital One. If you read about what happened is there was an S3 pocket misconfiguration, right? That's what m most people would tell you. If you look into more, in more technical details and Hacker One actually published a really good blog about it is it's not just true. So it was a server-side request forgery through a open source web application firewall which gained credentials which being used then to to ever or using the privilege actually to copy the data over and get access to all the cloud services. So there was multiple things happened, but it, it's not just one thing at misconfiguration, a three pocket open to the public. So server side forgery, what that is actually, server side request forgery, what this is actually is you trick a server or you trick a server to do something or run a command which shouldn't run, right? And Regarding AWS, it was actually run a web application firewall on a cloud, which is mod security, it's the open source one. Actually get access to the meta service, get the full privileged access to the, get all the keys around that, get the full, and the role, the security role had full access to, uh, to the cloud services, which um, to all the cloud servers, and that actually enabled them to download all this uh, content, which means there was multiple things happen. So if you think about cloud security, how you should think about it. And it's a, we all know the shared responsibility model, right? We all know, and they make it a little bit easier. AWS has a great picture, Google has a great picture, everyone has a great, it's a shared security model. So the infrastructure is being taken care of it. So everything which runs like the data, which is stored there, the servers, the supply chain, how they get the hardware, this is, this is actually taking care of it. Also software, I talk software about OS level, that's up to the hypervisor, right? And the rest is your job, or our job actually, to secure it. You need to think of application, workloads, data, and access management, how you configure that, how you have your policy management, and how you enable developers. So my belief is why as an enterprise company, a manufacturing service, why is the cloud actually interesting for us? It's a very simple thing is, the customer asking for more data. They're asking, they, get, they want to have access, they want to see how much output we have in a line, how much quality defects we have. They won't get instant access, so we get more and more requests of data sharing, also for inventory and supply chain management, right? So we need to actually switch ourselves, 
just not just setting up a line to manufacture stuff, but also provide data at the point at any time they the customer wants, give them access to whatever they need, which is a fundamental <laughs> differentiator for us as well, because it enables us as well to predict things like, I know before anyone else in the world, I think as a manufacturing services from supply chain's perspective, how the world will look like. Because if you look at supply chain, whatever comes on the market in like November has to be manufactured and ordered stuff in March, February, right? To get this to the, to the store. So it's really interesting to see what you can do with data or predictive, predictive maintenance. This is the things we are really interested. So, what did this do to my security program? Nothing. The cloud did not change anything in terms of the overall security. And if you're familiar with the NIST cloud framework, that's actually the NIST cybersecurity framework. I call it the cloud framework here. But basically, it's the same thing. I want to have, within a minute, I want to detect if there's any abnormality. Within 10 minutes, I want to respond. With two hours, I want to quarantine these things. And I want to have at least an 80% way that I see, hey, can be resilience against issues. That's the whole program we are doing in my, from our company. This is my team needs to work with it. Everything we do has to reflect to these numbers and say, is this helping to contribute to these numbers? Is this helping us to do that? Cloud is a little bit different, we have to think. And I, I use this pr principle. And the castle is actually close where I am born. That's, if you go to Europe, it's big, right? We, there's many castles, the big ones, right? How did they build the castles is building the walls up to the mountain, building all perimeter around it, try to protect the king or whoever is in the castle. And then they say, oh, if you breach the first perimeter, let's move it up to the second one because they are stronger and more, more difficult to come in. That's how we did on-premise infrastructure or security, right? Fire was around, IDS systems, endpoint protection, whatever the traditional security layers are, that's exactly what you do. You have the perimeter and say, hey, this is my internal network. I'm actually separating my internal network. Sometimes like VLANs are being used as separation. By the way, VLANs was never be designed for security reason. VLANs was designed for broadcast domains. We miss, just misuse it a little bit for the security. You missed you said well. And I think right now with on-premise, we have to go away. On the cloud, I believe you have to use the bodyguard approach. And we talk about multi-cloud. You can do whatever, think about. What it means is you need to set up the infrastructure, but the security should go with the workload, with the services, whatever it is, right? You need to have a policy management where you can say, hey, if this workload will be transferred to another cloud, my security get, goes with it which means my policies, my configuration, everything, there's some flavors or nuances between the clouds, but it needs to go with it. So you can't set up like this infrastructure, create a new firewall, update the policy. This is not going to work. Why is, I believe it's not going to work is the reason why we are changing the model is going to the cloud is to be poor, to have enable developers to do things without creating a service now request, waiting for 10 approvals to go ahead, or do a CapEx request and those kind of stuff, right? It slows down everything. The, if you think about your mobile phone these days, it's updating automatically. So what we want to enable our developers actually is moving the way that we say, hey, you know what? You don't ask need to security. You don't ask need infrastructure to start developing and providing updates, moving from lead time to deployments. So I want to have them deploy your functionality once a week once a day, once in every hour, which changed fundamentally how you think about security because think about code checks. How can you do a static code check if you have to deploy code once a day? It's not going to work because my team needs longer to analyze the check, mitigate the check. So that will also create the things you have to think about how you do application code check. It's changed the way how we, how we have to approach it, right? But that's, I think, it's a fundamental difference from my perspective, what I see is like, and that's not really yet rolled out. It's, you need to think about, my team has to change from being like infrastructure guys or whatever team it is, to be a policy management, configuration management team, and think about it, what do I need to do to, that I can have this attached to the services or to the, to the workload, right? So this is, I believe, it's the difference. And I just picked up, a, I think we saw that before, so, the network, right? If we do network separation on on-premise, we do VLANs, access control list, 
We do like, we think because we create 50 VLANs, we are more secure because we control the traffic within the VLANs, right? That's not going to really work well. Be honest, on premise, I haven't seen anything protecting anything like that because access controllers are very basics. It's like your car key. Um, if you lock your cars with your keys, it's actually, it's not really protection because it takes a lot, around these days, between 15 to 30 seconds to actually get in a car. So it's a false sense of security. That's, I think, it's also. Awesome. But what, what I have and what I try with my team is a fundamental change and say, guys, okay, if this is not working the way you thought, how you have to adopt your, your thinking in the cloud. So let's say we can't protect the network as the way it is. So what can we do actually to be still be secure, right? What technology, and there's maybe some missing gaps. Because if you think about API monitoring, it's important, right? How you get abnormally between an API course, if you encrypt the API course, and those kind of things, we have to think about it. So IDS, it's a terrific, it's not as easy in the cloud as it was on-premise. So this is the things where I tell my team now, okay, rethink the way you approach security, which is very hard because if you're in the field for 15, 20 years and think one way, you have to shift around. And we talked one or two talks before how we need to shift developers. You also need to shift the security team. You need to shift the infrastructure team, right? This is fundamental because we serve now the developers. We do not serve, and the developers, or we all serve the business, but I don't like go and say, hey guys, you can't do this anymore, stop, or you need to go to 15 approval. It's a self-service thing. It should be a self-service, which I think it's actually great for security. We haven't just reached the point. If I can give an, a given framework and say, hey guys, attach the security to things, and the security comes with it, and it's not an afterthought, it actually will help us to protect it more. So what, like two things we are considering, like basic things, TLS, SSL decryption, threat prevention, workload, based endpoint, network traffic, log management. What I don't, I think what I forgot here is actually what's really important is configuration management. In the cloud, 95% of the issues, as I said, is really based on configuration issues. And that's the key thing, how you manage your policies, how you manage your configuration, right? And as we know, open SV buckets, how you detect those kind of things. There's a lot of tools out there for doing that. I read the AWS Meta service. That was one of the things I read. It's a 130 page document to read how you configure that. So that's quite a lot. You can make a, quite a lot of mistakes, right? And we get the movie because usually we had this joke read the manual, right? Um, that's a lot of things you can do wrong. So, so governance comes in, in in terms of you need to find out if your configuration is right or wrong. But like I found it interesting for like uh, cloud security projects, I found it interesting encryption tokenization, which actually the cloud is great because now you have all the database services which provide you encryption. If you ever had like the infrastructure where you had to protect uh, not just the database itself, but color or the fields, right, for social security numbers or whatever you used encryption or tokenization. It was a quite a complicated process to do that. You had a lot of infrastructure for key management. Um, if you are, if you are like a consumer provider, you had to have HSM modules. That's the harder thing. These days, we using Box, for example, we have our own key safe running in AWS. Very easy. I have my key backup in our data center, but that's a backup I'm testing every six months. So it's pretty, really, it's really easy to use once it's set up and configured correctly. That would be amazing complex process years ago on premise. And that's where I see the benefit. But if you take, for example, the capital to want to preach, I would actually doubt the encryption would help you to protect the data because you had the ad someone had the admin key, he would have access to that, right? So you most likely good also the encryption keys. So that's the next, next thing you have to think about it. So configuration management, I think it's important. And because like, for example, you said, hey, I'm encrypted, I'm tokenized my data fields or whatever it is, I'm basically, nothing can happen, it's not true. By the way, it was never true because you have to think about, um, like Anthem, I was an Anthem customer, got preached because social security number was not uh, 
was not encrypted, right? Which was interesting as they had HIPAA requirement. So those kind of things you really have to think about. Multi-factor authentication. And actually, multi-factor authentication is interesting because I think it should be now the norm, and it's going to be the norm in the future. There's no, no doubt about that one. If you, use a, if you use, for example, Office 365, you enable multi-factor authentication using like Okta, like we do. There's a lot of things you have to consider a lot more than that because you need to switch all your apps to modern authentication. So I had to shut down a couple of applications to really be fully protected, right? It's not just you enable multi-factor authentication, you're saying, I'm done. That's not true. So there's a lot of things you have to consider with multi-factor authentication. Then you have the session tokens can be stolen. So you have to rethink again how to, how to implement and doing that. I am a strong believer in automation. Security should come with this automation, right? We want to give the policies, we want to give them a way. I want to give the developers a framework, but don't go out, you can't go outside of the framework. Within the framework, you can do what you want, have to do to do your job. I am not a developer. I don't know the pain of developers. But, I mean, it's not easy to, I made the trick actually, I made the most senior development lead in our company, the security guy which was really great because it helped me to understand. He knows the pain, right? When you're under pressure, you need to develop the code, you need to get it out at a certain date, right? The security guy would say, hey, you forgot to do this, you forgot to do that. So automation, I also believe, is really important. Those kind of things that this is enables and takes some load away, but also some pain away. Self-service is also important, user-friendly. I liked it today when we had this Kubernetes and in the morning the keynotes, how easy it is now to sync set up, like Crockroach when they showed, right, how multi SQL database easily, you turn it on, you choose, and then you're running basically as first basic, right? Think about back 10 years ago, if you had to do that. Order servers, order install software, configure software, this is the things you had to do in multiple countries. Today you go on a website within like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you have your base up and running, right? That's actually amazing, uh, on my belief. This is just really where IT is going great, right? I mean, everyone is used to Google Maps now. It's so easy to pull out and go where, where you are. We had just a power outage in California. You will not believe it because it's Silicon Valley and they shut down the power because of the wildfires risk. Um, it was amazing when your phone doesn't charge overnight and you have actually, <laughs> it's not working and you need to find your way back without Google Maps. And you're like, oh shit, <laughs> where well, I have to go? So that's the old fashioned way, it still works um, because when you know the highways, but we are so used to technology these days now that I think um, it's very interesting to see, like from a security perspective, but also just from a general technology perspective, is what happens if technology is not available, right? So user-friendly, I love Google Maps. I mean, I'm old, well, just an age getting older. So I still remember when I had car maps, like running through the Paris, which has no street names at all. If you ever get lost in Paris, that's exactly what happened. Um, so user-friendly is very important, but I map this also to security. How can I make security user-friendly to my developers, to my people in the business? It's a very, if you think about, this is a very different concept that, because I'm used to say, or people saying CISO says no. They stop the business from doing their job. Um, I don't believe in that. I just sometimes have to say no and say this is not the right way to do that, but I provide you a different way to do that. But it needs to be really user-friendly, not complicated. I actually killed most of my approvers because I don't see, I talk to my team and say, guys, why do I need to prove that? I have zero insight in the approval. I have no, not more knowledge than you guys do, but you want me to prove because you believe I'm the CISO and I take the overall risk, which is absolutely bollocks in my opinion because the team knows way better what it is about it. So you approve and I'm still responsible for it and accountable if something happened. But I trust my team that they know what decision they have to take, right? So user-friendly really also comes down to this thing, insecurity, rethinking, or how we should approach security. API monitoring is very important, I think. A lot of things will come uh, through API monitoring and dynamic policies. Um, I think actually um, giving the policies 
managing policies, configuration management is such a key for the cloud. Now we need to find the right people and train the right skills on that. That's, I think, it's what I'm facing. You might be a consumer, which is easier. For me, finding the right people or training with the right mindset is very difficult these days now because they're used to have kind of engineering and you, now you're moving to a config and policy management, which is not always exciting, honestly. So that's a really fundamental problem I'm tackling right now, how we make this happening, how, how we train, how we get these people into this new area, right, as we are moving as a company. And just, we have nine minutes I'm earlier with that. Privacy, it's going to be a topic. Whatever architect or data or what you're doing, data privacy is going to be a big deal. We can debate about GDPR, right and wrong, all day long, I fully agree. It's kind of a mixed law in my opinion, but there's more than one privacy laws. It's coming. California is releasing an act. Uh, Singapore did. Um, so there's many countries will follow, right? My concern is more on a data localization uh, because that make our, we're going to make our life more, way more complicated if we have to start storing data within the countries. And it's actually against, I think, a fundamental principle that data should flow, be, free, free, should flow without any restriction within the data, within the right legal, legal requirements. But it's, it's something you have to think when you, when you architect in a solution these days now. How can you make sure when there's a new law coming on that you don't need to redevelop an architect? How can you make sure you have these pockets where you can say, hey, I store my data in this country, this country, because there's a legal requirement, right? Serverless security, what I mean with that is we're using now all, uh, it's getting Kubernetes, we had Kubernetes, we have Docker's containers, now is it like, now we're consuming services, right? So serverless actually means there is no, you plug into, into the microservices, you need to monitor those kind of things. It's not going to be easy. There's solutions out there, but they are not mature as they should be yet. So there's still a progress we have to make because it's getting very complicated, my, in my opinion, right? So there's a complex things behind it, how you're going to monitor, how you know, who is communicating with what services, how you monitor those kind of stuff in public cloud, including maybe in your own premise cloud. So we will see how that works. And flexible frameworks, what I mean with that is actually, I want to move things around. We discussed it. That's not always, I don't want to just be doing it because of IT, right? For us as a company, it's more like I don't want to be locked in a cloud because of financial reason. And the reason for that is I may be a small customer for them. I don't spend 100 million or something, right? So I want to give my contractual requirements. I want to actually be able to in a good negotiation position. So I don't want to be kind of independent from everything and say, hey, I want to move in this cloud. I want to move in this cloud. I might even want to move back on premise because we have a customer or we have a legal requirement. So I want to be, but doing that is not easy, honestly. Um, so I, we try to create this flexible frameworks and say, okay, well, how can we achieve that and for what services? We, we can, I pick certain things out because not everything is achievable right now. Uh, so you have to focus on certain things to have th this kind of flexible framework. So basically that's it, what I wanted to talk about security. I think we have six minutes left for questions. I'm happy to answer any question if someone has. If not, then you are ready to go for drinks. Looks like you want to drinks. It's okay. <laughs> this one. So, talking about like shifting responsibility of security to the application teams or like developers because. Yeah. They know the architecture, the design, whatever. They are perhaps in a better position to understand than like the CISO team. Um, I guess, so the strategy you would recommend is to provide like the user-friendly framework and all these things and say, developers, it's on you to understand data flow and all that within your applications. And then the accountability is the tools that you, did, I guess, that, that exist for saying like, do the security rules for these deployments make sense? Is there some vulner is there some access vulnerability that like is the result of a bug or a misconfiguration and that sort of, those sorts of things? Is is that basically it? Yes and no. Okay. So um, the no comes from the place that 
it's not shifting responsibility in terms of like, I don't feel responsible for that anymore, right? So I think the shift, what I, what I really mean the shift is the developers actually should tell me their needs. So, so usually we went approach, right? We provide the infrastructure until this is the infrastructure, that's how you develop, right? So Could it's be, more like a culture shift. It's a culture shift, yes, which is a fundamental, I think it's, it's really easy. For sure it's also, say with the culture shift is come, okay, if you tell me what a framework is, I try to figure out, but you also have a certain responsibility, right? On, how you understand your application. Because I think in the end, at some point, we have to track with the developers what they, in terms of they need to explain, right? So now power out. <laughs> I'm used to that now, okay. <laughs> but it's a culture shift, it's more of a culture shift as well, right? Also in this, my point is also security team, like if you think about application security where you did dynamic, the pen testing still will be there, right? But we try to automate now the pen testing. How you automate that pen testing? It's, and there's still a human perspective which has something which machines can't do to think out of the box yet. Um, whenever come, but it's really like the culture shift is very hard with, for the security team. It's really like, it's not just the security team, but also the infrastructure team. I think the culture shift that we enable developers and how we have to think about this, it's my opinion, it's something I'm struggling and try to, and being challenged with it. And it definitely, at least in my mind, sort of fits the model of shifting the developer mindset from like on-prem to, or I guess like cloud native thought process, which is that like, I need to consider beyond just my application business logic, what the needs of the system are, whether that's like, networking connectivity concerns or all those things and so saying security is part of that as well yes seems like it sort of fits yeah it's, it should be right you should go, because that's where it starts from i think um gdpr has a principle of privacy and security by design i think that's a fundamental thing because most of the time when we talk about security is an aftermate um, so I come with things around to make it secure, which is always a problem in my opinion, because it's always, it's never a full big solution or never full addressing of the risk mitigation, right? Or it's, it's always a compromise you do, right? If you do it from the beginning, I mean, look, iOS did it really, did most of the stuff right from the beginning and there's still a lot of vulnerabilities in the software. But fundamental, what they, how they designed the operating system was actually really by security really by the best principles at this time, right? I think that's the shift where I want for my team is guys, that's where it needs to go, right? Think about when you develop an application, think about network latencies kind of things, but also security, right? How I make it secure, how I think about that. Which is, I think, the problem is the pressure from the business to deliver the software quite a time. Which I understand, there is, you have a deadline, you need to hit the deadline, their security might be an after or uh, force apart, right? I saw this, I saw this a couple of times. So I think that's a kind of a problems we have. But I think in the end, we need to end up that they need to think about security as part of their job. Hope that answer your question. Yeah. I like your philosophy as far as like new development. Um, but what about like legacy systems, especially? Because if you go cloud, there's still going to be an anchor oh. of some sort of legacy systems that... So that's why you need to separate businesses. I will always have that. Uh, because that's a long-term investment in legacy systems. So I, have, I will have a certain set of teams who actually have to deal with that. There's no question about that because uh, think about like investments like in your B systems or some other sort of stuff, it's a 15 years to 20 years time frame. I think when we talk in 15 years, we might talk about completely something different in a conference about instead of public cloud. Okay. Um, so I still need to address that, don't get me wrong. It's, it's not something, it will go away. If you're a consumer and you started native in the cloud or something, it's different, right? That's a consumer business, which is a different set of topic than I have to do. But yeah, so, so we still, I will still have my team monitoring, do the uh, traditional on-premise, which is, don't get me wrong, it's also important. It's not unimportant, right? But also, I know where my business needs to go and I need to support it. I know the journey is the mighty cloud. It's, it's definitely the ops model because everyone is asking for quicker software, more product features every time. So, but yeah. All right, drinks. <laughs>